this, uh, we've actually combined a special plenary and a, and, 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 and a panel discussion, uh, and we're calling it the work of the future, what's next in skilling India. I just want to clarify that worker also means the entrepreneur of the future, it's not necessarily a worker as we, as we define it. And what we are, what we are saying is, one uh, of the four workers in today's world may not be employable by 2030. Uh, this is like, of course, discounting unemployment. And this is uh, challenging for the especially critical issues for workers at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, India as a country, uh, in relation to its GDP, has far less number of entrepreneurs than many of the Latin American and African countries. And Vineet knows this because Sankalp has now actually even made inroads into Africa. And how are we going to get entrepreneurs and workers uh, uh, who are already excluded from entrepreneurial opportunity or work opportunity into the market uh, value chain? Uh, chain? As we, uh, you know, what, as a session has been planned, uh, we are, uh, you know, we're seeking answers to four uh, critical uh, questions. Um, are we skilling appropriately? Uh, and analysts point to the fact that tech may destroy many jobs, but also uh, open new fields. For example, the person who used to answer your call and said, do you want to speak in English and Hindi and manually transfer it, is now being replaced by the IVR system. Uh, if you look at um, the new digital marketing job, this was not in the radar screen uh, seven months uh, ago, and there are many, many such examples the classic one being the telegraph uh, or telegraph operator and the telegram deliverer has been replaced by email. And while skilling institutes, and we see some institutes in the audience are aggressively training the youth, we need to be really understanding the delivery and design of livelihood support systems so that they can adapt quickly uh, given the uncertain uh, trajectory. The second uh, question is, are we training enough entrepreneurs? Are we actually training them and putting them in, in place? And what is, uh, are we enabling uh, them to actually succeed? The third one is, are we matching the demand and supply appropriately? Uh, how do we uh, make jobs available in the uh, appropriate location? And are we delivering technology and capital uh, appropriately? So we have a great uh, panel here uh, and uh, plenary speaker, Mr. Sunil Arora, Secretary, Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship, uh, comes, uh, is actually created history because he is the first secretary of the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. It can never be repeated again uh, in the history of India. Uh, and he comes with a very strong uh, success uh, and delivery um, career in the civil service, being serving two chief ministers in Rajasthan, being the chairperson of the Rajasthan Investment, Industrial and Investment Corporation. He's actually uh, turned around and head Indian Airlines in the most critical period, and perhaps was also one of the very few people who actually was involved in solving a hijack problem. That's, 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 a, that's a different uh, side of the person. I think, sir, if I remember, you were seven days old or eight days old in, in that ministry when it, when, when it happened but uh, comes with wide experience. The panel is great. Anant Rao, Chairman, Skill Pro and MD, Focus Ventures. Uh, disclaimer, um, everybody in the panel, in some way or the other, is associated with NSDC. Uh, so uh, Anant is uh, a funded organization from NSDC. Skill Pro is a funded organization from NSDC, but he's also an investor. Um, Sabrinath Naya, Skill Very, again, Innovator uh, has done tremendous things. Uh, we saw his capability. In fact, Mr. Arora chaired a panel, uh, innovation panel, and selected him for funding. He's, a, he's in the process of being funded by NSDC. And he has also actually been supported by one another company that we have funded called Microspin. And uh, the gentleman there who is an entrepreneur. Uh, so Sabrina, welcome here. Uh, Anurana Ramchandran, Direct Investments, Omadia Network along with Vineet Rai, two people skeptical about investing in the skill space, but on the board of uh, Pratham, who we've actually invested, and Pratham found a very nice way of getting money out of them. They kept on telling them, that, look, you know, we are paying this interest to NSDC. Can you help us repay capital? And they 
found some way to contribute to Pratham, and Pratham repaid the loan that they had taken from NSDC, and I now believe Pratham is coming for an even larger loan. So uh, Anuradha, you're going to have to do us uh, another favor sometime soon. And finally, Madan Patki, uh, uh, co-founder, managing director, and CEO, Health Health High. He's actually been in the skill space for a much long time. He actually started an assessment company, did the assessment for NAC and NACTET, and, and now he's also a partner with uh, NSD. This is a great panel. So if I can you know, actually start with you, Anand, you know, uh, with the question that we are trying to answer. What, you know, are we uh, skilling appropriately, or are we just, you know, uh, training uh, people and leaving them being, we're not connecting with the jobs, or are we necessarily looking at the delivery and design of livelihood support systems to go in? So, so that's a, thank you, Dilip. Um, that's a very open-ended question, so I will, I will just give my uh, feel on that. Now, we've been executing on the ground, uh, put 50,000 people into jobs so far, and our learnings are that uh, when we did this three years ago, we were really struggling because there was no way to um, really tell the candidates that these skills will get them jobs. And uh, when and certification was a huge issue. Everybody looks at certificates at the end of the day. And here they go through so much training. And uh, uh, there's nothing to certify them. So I think uh, that was one big roadblock we saw, and uh, SSCs have started to address that, and uh, thanks to all the efforts from NSDC uh, that has gone into SSCs. But one SSCs, and more recently, I think, uh, uh, if I'm correct, uh, that has become uh, a nationally accredited, accepted, uh, uh, I think there was a law recently, Dilip may correct me, but uh, that allowed these to be regular certifications. Now with that, but nobody knows about it. Industry doesn't know about it. Uh, and we need to, uh, I think, go out there and let the industry know very, very clearly that these are certifications for jobs of this kind uh, and be able to do that. So I think in terms of putting a framework together, uh, we got it right. But in terms of getting industry acceptance, there is still a lot of work to go. So I, I see that as one area where unless we uh, you know get that uh, get that structure much more accepted by industry and by uh, candidates which which includes uh, you know right from marketing the program uh, and includes doing things like uh, i think the pm's new initiative um, that's that's being put out but it needs a lot more to scale uh, three, four hundred million people that we are thinking we should scale in the next four or five years so i think that's going to be um, a key to this I also feel like uh, uh, for an industry to get acceptance, like Dilip pointed out earlier, we need investors to come in, we need debtors to come in and support the industry. And that's when uh, private participation and all that happens. Now, we see a lot of challenges in that kind of uh, uh, approach right now. Um, you know, the, there is projects that uh, um, government talks about and gives for skilling companies, and they do a lot of times fantastic job of uh, trying to do it in large volumes, but at the same time treating some of these partners as partners in the uh, ecosystem that need long-term sustenance. In other words, you know, these these should be geared as institutes for long-term skilling rather than here is a four-month project, here is a six-month project, and things like that. So that has been a little bit of uh, the unpredictability of long-term uh, has has been a little bit of a challenge, and I think that's where. A um, lot of uh, companies look at it and say, okay, uh, how are you creating that long-term predictability for a skilling center so that, uh, you know, uh, more people can be skilled in that region. So I see that uh, being a little bit uh, of a challenge, but there is, uh, again, uh, um, you know, uh, we're doing a lot of things right, let's put it that way, uh, but in order to create that volume that we need to uh, create, the scale that we need to do, uh, I think a lot of things have to fall in place. I'm sure everybody has a comment on this, so I'll just leave it with those two points and, and then give it to the others too. Thank you, Anand. Just two points that you've raised. One is the certification issue, and the second is predictability and long-term sustainability of, of the uh, training um, centers. I think uh, this uh, leads really, Madan, to what we are looking at. Are we matching demand and supply appropriately? If you recall, you know, just we're just discussing that, are we looking at making people appropriate for relevant jobs uh, in the appropriate location matched to the right skill? Or uh, you know, how do we do this uh, thing? You know, I mean, yes, yesterday, I think uh, 
the minister and the, the Mr. Mr. Arora were present when we launched the second version two of the skill gap reports, which actually gives you cluster identification. But as training organizations, are we actually doing that? Or how can we, uh, how can we get employers and skill developers and civil society to you know, play a role in this, in enabling this to happen? Thanks, Dilip, and uh, pleasure to be at this uh, forum. Uh, when I was looking at this demand supply and thinking about it if, uh, this morning, uh, one of the images that I wanted to present to you, which will explain this conundrum the, the, the best way, I'm sure all of you have seen this, uh, this visual where there is a photo of a very shriveled old lady. And you keep looking at it and suddenly you, you will see a beautiful young person emerging out of that. I'm sure you would have seen several of these uh, visual tricks that happen. And my view is that the supply demand gap is something like that. That on one hand, you will see the industry always saying, listen, I don't have talent. I have so many jobs, but I'm not finding people. And on the other hand, you'll have people, youth saying, I want jobs, but I'm not getting any. And the conundrum is best explained by this. And my view is, as a nation, we should look at that beautiful woman emerging out of that uh, picture. And what I mean by that is, can we look at that individual at the center of the universe and build everything around that? You know, at Meritrack, you know, Dilip, you were referring to my earlier avatar, we did India's first employability report on engineering uh, graduates in, way back in 2005, and that 25% number emerged out of that report, which later on became the default number that everybody started quoting. And now I look back and realize, in a way, how wrong we were, because you can always look at anything from two perspectives. You can look at it from the perspective of the industry, and maybe the report was right, and maybe all reports are right to say that only X percent are employable. But when you look at it from the perspective of the individual, I believe, and in the work that we're doing at Herald High, that everyone is employable, and I believe we don't have an employability issue. What we have is a matching problem. And what do we need to match? Not just the IQ, EQ, which has been the center of the skills part, but I think the more important part is to match aspirations of people to, of course, what they need to develop to match those aspirations and the intersection with the industry. So I believe it's like a, uh, the employability happens at the intersection of AQ, what I call as aspirations quotient, to IQ, EQ, which is where the skills and the whole aspect of how do you be in that job, to the opportunity that exists for that point of IQ, AQ, and EQ to happen. And that's the matching issue that we need to solve. So in that context, I would think that there should be, if you were to, if you were to truly solve the supply demand issue, from all of our perspectives, we need to look at it from three angles. It's almost like uh, you know, and then in England, when the king used to, uh, when when the old king used to die and the new king used to come in, the 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 cry was always that you know the king is dead, long live the king, right? So I think there's a, I want to use that analogy to to say three things. One that training is dead, long live transformation. I think at a fundamental level, it's not about training, but it's about transforming that individual to, to, to achieve the dreams that he or she wants to achieve. It is just not short-term training. It is about the long-term transformation of that individual. Second, skills is dead, long live careers. We need to take away from the lens of just a skills, but from an individual's perspective, we got to look at how do we construct long-term careers for that individual, and it's just not about a short-term course. It is, of course, about the short-term course, but it does not have to end there. It has to move much beyond that into careers that can be constructed. And the last part is jobs are dead, long-live job creators. And I come back to the point that Dilip was making that we need to instill that aspect that everyone has to be a job creator. I see no way that India can absorb all the 115 million people that's supposed to enter the workforce in the next 10 years if we are not able to instill that aspect of entrepreneurial thinking and job creation. I'm not saying everybody will end up being a job creator, but the attempt should be that. And in that process, even if some of them become job creators, we can actually create enough jobs for everybody else. Right? So, in, so you know, in a tangential way of of, of address all the things, we'll come back to it, but that's my early thoughts. Uh, thanks, Madan. And really, uh, Sabina, you know, this is something um, what Anand and uh, both uh, Madan referred to was, they, it was an underlying thing, and you know, how do you make it sustainable? Because let's say if you want to train a welder, hmm. 
the traditional cost of training welder is about 50 to 60,000 rupees, right? Yeah. So what's the role of technology hmm. uh, going forward? And how does technology both enable us to get two answers? Are we skilling appropriately? And are we matching the demand and supply uh, appropriately? So really like your views on that. Thank you, Dilip. Uh, I'm actually glad that uh, there is a perfect alignment in what uh, uh, Anand said and what Madan said here uh, about certifications, aspirations, and having the individual at the center. Uh, one of the things that uh, we learned at Skill Very while we were building simulators for skill training is that uh, the cost of not training is not properly understood by people, not by the potential uh, job seekers, not by the potential employers. So right now what is happening is the cost of not training is resulting in certain mistakes which either the end customer pays or either the employer pays. So I don't think this will be sustainable in the long run. So we'll have to possibly find methods of uh, um, ensuring that skill training happens to avoid these mistakes. Now, uh, if we look at certifications, then the challenge that Anand mentioned here comes that uh, is certification trusted enough? Is there a premium that industry is willing to pay for these certificates? So somewhere I think if we are able to bring uh, for the hard skills bit an equivalent of a GRE score, which uh, is trusted and where you know you can know if I say that I am having a score of five and you are having a score of eight, then uh, uh, you are better b uh, better than me by so much you know, measurable way. And it links in some way to what I call as the Grisham's law of skills. So Grisham has given a good law for currency. I think the same applies to skills. Like uh, bad certification drives out the good. Uh, so. Uh, bad certification devalues every other uh, genuine certificate too. So unless we have an objectively measured and proven proficiency in hard skills, it uh, all the certifications would be devalued. Now, I think NOS from uh, NSDC has been the best initiative to have happened in the last six years. For 60 years, we had no link between what uh, industry wanted and what uh, the training centers were providing. So NS NOS has provided that framework now, can we extend it, build on it by making an objectively measurable metric for each NOS? And this is where I think technology comes in. And what we have found is, uh, when we started building the welding simulator, we looked at all existing welding simulators. All of them were modeled on physics. You know, when I am welding, how does the molten pool of uh, metal uh, behave? What is the fluidity? What is the viscosity? What is the rate of... Uh, uh, no, temperature gradient across the heat affected zone. None of this actually makes sense for the entry level worker, whereas it makes sense for maybe developing the next type of welding. So we then found that uh, there are uh, smaller, what we call as skill elements that you can break down a skill into that is totally dependent on the, on the learner. So like Madan said, uh, putting the person at the center. So instead of focusing on the process or on the machine that you're uh, operating, you focus on the learner, how does he react to how a machine behaves. So uh, for example, in welding, we can uh, define four skill elements, the speed of the torch, the position of the torch, what angle are you holding the torch, what distance are you making from the surface of the weld. These four elements have a huge impact on the quality of the weld. So uh, what we found is that technology can measure these skill elements, technology can give corrective uh, feedback on what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. It can, uh, it can also correlate the effect of skills to cor the effect of uh, to, to quality. So if there is a way in which uh, such things can be measured, given targeted feedback, and then a final certificate, then the certificate becomes ob objectively measurable. So this what was what we discovered for welding. Then we discovered that for a whole lot of other skills, including you know, similar skills in manufacturing like spray painting or crane operator, to something like as diverse as a laparoscopic surg surgeon's hand movement, or uh, a paramedic or a construction worker bending a bar of iron. All this can be split down to elements that can be measured using audio, visual, and haptic technologies. Now, uh, we thought that we had discovered something grand by uh, doing it this way. Uh, but uh, later we discovered that uh, there is a field of science relatively unknown called uh, psychophysics, which is uh, uh, the theory of measuring how psychology and physics are interrelated. So, uh, so, so we found that simulators or any technology tools that are used for skilling should focus on 
psychophysics instead of physics and focus on skill transfer how do we ensure that the person who is learning has actually learned and acquired the right kind of skills and at what level uh, and therefore if we can extend nos in uh, using psychophysics that uh, can be measured objectively across then we can have a vision for extending the itis to digital itis where uh, every single uh, digital iti is probably a small area where uh, like could be a village panchayat or a common accessible area where an aspirant can come in and then uh, check out which from a suite of skills check out which skill is he most suited for and then know whether i'm best in uh, welding or best in maybe giving an injection and uh, in this way by having a technology angle to it maybe the aspirations can also be increased so we found this in welding i'm sure this can be extended to uh, other skills as well and i think uh, a lot of companies like skillvery should come up and then uh, take this uh, forward thank you uh, thank you uh, i think uh, you know you actually made very key points there but he is only focused on maybe less than 0.05% of the nosses that have been created and the <laughs> so there's an opportunity for them and he'll become sustainable so for those of you who are looking at financing such innovations uh, please do help because that's what will actually help uh, bridge supply and demand and are we skilling appropriately really here and that brings us to the question is are we using you know existing capital appropriately and uh, that's where um, you know anurag i think uh, you know we can only scale right and if we if we use capital appropriately and I, i would just like say the nscc example was we don't give grants we we actually a uh, crazy combination i think vinith in the earlier conversation described us very nice you know venture capital venture debt that's what he does huh? venture capital venture debt development finance grant equity uh, kind uh, of a model but in this space or rather you know what's important is that small capital is required mm -hmm. you know entry level uh, first time uh, capital is required few crores you know they can transform this whole space so how do we actually bridge that gap and what will make you invest i mean how can i turn it around from the current minister of state finance to you to say that okay now umedia then we need say okay we want to invest in skilling we want to invest in innovation we want to support the government programs so to to the to the three shrines today certification aspiration and innovation sorry are you able to hear me um so i'm i'm just going to add the fourth one which to uh, capital provider is important which is standardization mm. in the absence of standardization scale is difficult to achieve and if scale is difficult to achieve the venture capitalist is not very interested as such right so um the and that's where we have struggled in the past we've participated actually in the certification part of the curve uh where we are beginning to see that so many people are beginning are trained in coming out there is a way of standardizing but that itself took a very long time to to come to uh, to come to a kind of uh, a level where people are interested in putting in capital or can innovate around it and build the right kind of a product right so if you look at it skilling for instance everybody had their own internal training program and then you know like there was no standardized kind of a course which is available right now people look at like okay what are you trained to deliver and therefore be on the on that basis you can actually have a certification standardized certification so we we saw standardization coming up first in the certification piece as opposed to the skilling piece uh because skilling is still actually highly fragmented and it is not very clear that there is a a clear understanding of where is a gap in skilling before you can so then you then you define therefore how you train people and then on top of that you then say that you know like this is the standardized this is the standard you know outcome which is or skill which is actually acceptable across board across people so if there is a person who is saying that uh, hey for you know a truck driver this is a skill it's great if somebody is saying for a volvo truck driver this is different mm. from a shock leland truck driver this is different you you're always going to have fragmented people doing doing the training and that is not looked to be scalable and therefore it is not looked to be fundable so that's basically where we saw that there is a gap in terms of providing the financing and if there is a way of addressing this this standardization we've also seen that you know like uh, uh, it's th that definition or attacking that problem is nobody's business really right 
I am an entrepreneur. I'm running my business. I have to get enough number of talented people available today. That's all that everybody is focused on. But nobody is saying, hey, as an industry, this is my standard, standard quotient. So tell me the, how do I get enough people trained around this part of it? So that's what we feel is the missing link. It is not the availability of capital. It is not the availability of number of people, right? We always talk about the skill gap, and it is hundreds of millions. It's not hundreds of millions of people. Even if they pay one rupee, it's hundreds of millions of rupees. So it's not the size of the industry. It's, the, it's not the size of the problem. It is actually this missing element of saying standardized training means this, which means that people can actually achieve to, uh, you, you can train people well, there is a standard curriculum, then you certify on the basis of that, then you can finance it easily. So that's basically where we find the gap to be, and we are finding it very difficult to understand and, and you know, provide the kind of financing which is required at this point. Okay, so what we'll do now is, you know, the other three speakers, and then coming back to you another, a minute each, if you would like to respond to any point that the any other panelists made before we ask uh, the secretary to address, because I think standardization has crept in, and I don't know who's going to address that point. Scale also has crept in. Maybe, uh, Anand, start with you. Uh, yeah, I think uh, um, very important point about standardization, right? And that's where the uh, an initial attempt came from the SSC certification, the defining job roles, saying this is what you do in order to get certified as an electrician level one. And, uh, uh, and that's a valid certificate. Now, the challenge today we have, of course, you know, uh, there is a few of those uh, uh, developed and SSCs are delivering to that, and a uh, few more have to be done. But I think it's a, a good step in the right direction. The, the problem there is today it's just started and there's not enough awareness about it. So industry is not saying, hey, do you have uh, this? In fact, uh, yesterday I heard the minister say, um, you know, if you want a government job in 2020, you have to have mm -hmm. a skill certificate. It's a very, very strong statement. Yeah. I was very happy to hear that. But He's clearly in, in the direction of um, there is standardization. You have to go through that. You will get a certificate that the industry recognizes. And government as an employer is also going to look at that. And uh, I think now a lot of industry players coming in and saying, hey, are you uh, NSQF certified or are you SSC certified? Uh, and it's kind of new terminology still for the industry. And, and on the other side, the candidates don't still understand it. But the, some uh, active drives behind these programs can go a long way in standardization. So hopefully that's a, that's a first step. Uh, on the technology piece, I think, uh, you know, uh, very good talk on the content side. Um, but I also think that the delivery of um, training across rural regions using technology is also going to be an important component uh, of that uh, for scale. So those are at least two of, uh, points I would make. Yeah, so so it comes to you, I think, on the technology part, but just one bit of information before uh, you actually come in, Sabrinath, is the, you know, there's a partnership going which a lot of people don't, uh, don't, remember, uh, don't know of, and it's our inability to communicate this, that with the Citizen Service Center, CSCs, uh, NSDC has actually partnered with them and developed an online uh, content for motor mechanics, which Siemens, PLM, and Hero Motors are taking to the 1,24,000 uh, service uh, centers uh, across the country and training three to four people using technology. So that's also, and you know, we have to scale this. And I'm trying to get CSE to make it a sustainable business model, but seed capital for them to get, you know, 25% is a challenge. But, but I think, uh, Sabrina, you might have a perspective on yeah. the other comments made by people. Uh, so I would like to speak about uh, uh, first the finance angle and second uh, the ruggedness of uh, technology for scaling up in Indian case. So uh, financing could be at multiple levels. It could be at the, uh, the student level. It could be uh, at the entrepreneur who wants to run a training center level. It could be uh, at an industry level where you know, till they recover the benefits of a better skill. You know, at, at all these stages, I think there are lots of more innovations in the financing of it that can be done because many of these things seem like a chicken and egg problem. Because unless the industry sees benefits at the shop floor of having a certificate, they may not want to pay premium for a certificate. And unless a student is going to earn better money, they are not going to pay for a certificate. So who pays for certificate? I think it is still a very open question. Um, so I would like to hear from Anuradha about uh, what are her thoughts on that. Uh, 
And uh, to answer uh, Anand's question, I think the approach so far has been to look at uh, uh, what are the standardized, uh, you know, video-based and other methods of delivering knowledge in when we usually apply technology. You know, it requires internet or certain kind of... Uh, we were so far looking at ad adapting something that has been designed for another context and then trying to put it here. I think that approach may not always work, but if we can look at uh, redesigning from ground up. So, uh, for example, the welding simulators in our case, uh, we took about two years to design it and get it to a certain level, but there were always alpha and beta trials that happened, which ensured that in 15 months we could get 20 customers. Uh, in, an, in a market where uh, MNCs ha had been selling for six years and sold five machines. So the reasons are like it is rugged and it is, uh, my simulators are now running in uh, Digboy in Assam, in Mandi in Himachal, so all kinds of uh, Roorkee near uh, Delhi, so all kinds of varied levels it is working. Now, will it scale up to a larger number? I have 20, I think the market needs about 10,000 or 20,000. Uh, that's where financing again comes back. Mm -hmm. So I think technology, I think we, if you look at uh, designing at a very Indian requirement stage from ground up from Indians itself, it is quite possible. I don't think building technology is a problem with India. We have the capability. But, uh, you know, tying together NSDC is the, you know, one uh, entity of bringing all of these together. Second would be the financing of it. Not just the technology development, but also who pays for the skill development. Madan, you have two minutes. Yeah. I'll add a few more shuns to it to what Anuradha said. So the way that I'm thinking through this and stringing this together is there is aspiration, which has to be matched by clusterization of sorts from the industry. As an example, if you look at the evolution of the IT and the BPO industry, you know, software development took off as a cluster in Bangalore, FNA back office in Chennai, tech support in Hyderabad, investment banking, higher end in, 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 uh, in Mumbai, call centers in Delhi. And the aspirations of people in these markets were linked to that cluster. So therefore, the supply demand has to be matched on these two shunts, right? And then, of course, you have innovation. On the other hand, the innovation has to lead to a solution for the individual, right? Not just innovation for the sake of innovation, but innovation for the sake of providing a solution. Yeah. And somebody, what you talked about is exactly yeah. that, that how do you reduce and how do you do transfer? And the last shun is, you know, what you talked about another is the standardization leading to a certification mm -hmm. so that there is recognition that this stands for something. And in this, all of this, there is an ecosystem play. There is not a single entity who can stand up and say, you know what, I can do all of these shuns. There is government, private players, education systems, financing guys who all come together. And, and it brings back to the aspect of financing, that financing, in my view, has to be a hybrid solution rather than an individual. So what I mean is, especially in the skillings industry, if you were to call that, it has to be a combination of debt, equity and grant that will make a model sustainable. And I don't see a single type of capital coming in and saying we can make this model sustainable. And I think that's where the initiatives that's all coming together uh, uh, is looking good and we have to accelerate that uh, progress. Thanks, Madan. Anuradha, any uh, comments before I request Mr. Vora to speak? So, two, um, so Saburi raised this question for me specifically in terms of saying, you know, in education finance, how are you guys thinking about it? Because there are multiple levels of intervention. It could be a student level financing, it could be a center of where, which is delivering the content as a, as a financing, or it could be the content provider financing as well. So there could be multiple levels of financing. So how are you going to address this part of it and what's the thinking around it? And then there was uh, Madan's comment and around the different kinds of, again, like instruments like equity, debt, and grant, which is, which is currently available in the market. So I'm going to use actually aspiration as a basis to answer both of these questions as such. So for any, so venture level kind of, which is the equity part of the financing, right, that requires scale. For debt, it requires repayment capabilities. And for grant, uh, it requires intention. Right? That the, the intention that something that you're doing is going to improve the quality of life of that individual. So in the absence of that intention or in the absence of that evidence, it's going to like fall through as well. So all these are kind of like if you if you work through that, uh, you know, links links back to the aspiration. I do not have an answer, there, a ready-made answer which says that this is the right way of solving this problem. Nor can I answer the prob the question that uh, Sabri is asking directly. Well, what I can say from experience is this. 
uh, we saw actually our intent, in fact, still is to figure out a way of funding individuals, right? Like to turn the financing model on its head and say funding individuals. What instrument we'll figure out over a period of time, but nevertheless funding them so that they see the value in a program, taking a training and finding a way of creating a livelihood for, for themselves. That is actually a basic uh, you know, aspiration that we have. However, in the context of doing this, right, like we, uh, one of the things that we were, we were trying and struggling still as a problem is, if we fund them fully, then what's their skin in the game? The second part of it is who's going to pay for what, right? And what is, the, what is it that you know, makes people have the intention of paying for something, right? In the absence of paying, and if, if everything is free, then who's going to value it as well? So it's, it's a very difficult uh, uh, question to answer. And the only answer that we have so far discovered is that funding in, you know, like individuals is a hugely difficult problem, right? One is that there is no evidence that actually training needs to, uh, leads to livelihood improvement from our perspective. At scale is what I'm talking about. It, it happens in the lives of people. So in, in where we've intervened, where we've given an organization a grant in West Bengal to train people, the same organization is actually tied up to a rural BPO to place people so that you know, like the, the curve is actually completed. This is how we tried, a, tried an experiment. The few things that we are figuring out, the training organization is, when it is placing directly only with the captive organization, between the two there is a lot of friction. It says like, you know, you standardize your curriculum based on what is my, my need as such. Um, sorry, um, just one minute. <laughs> So, so there is a friction which is created if it is only captive as well. If it is non-captive, people go get placed and they get out of their job in three months because it's too far. It doesn't pay enough for me to stay in a city. My aspiration of a job of like, you know, sitting in an office might be solved, but it doesn't solve the, actually, it is not the kind of, it, it doesn't let me survive. So the salary is not en enough. So forget my repaying back my loan as such. So unless and until there is a, a way that all these kind of problems come together and everybody is pushing in the same direction, we are not going to find a problem. I think like that's the point that you were making as well. I don't think there is a direct answer to say that one person is able to uh, solve this. Thank you, Anuradha, and it's a real pleasure. You know, we can all be sure that the ministry is very cognizant of what you're saying. We also have the Joint Secretary, Ms. Josna Sittling, sitting and patiently taking notes uh, here, and she Will, and you know now uh, I think it's a real pleasure and honor to have uh, Sri Arora really deliver the plenary uh, the keynote address and then we will open it up for questions. Uh. My colleague Dilip, who and whose uh, other group of consultants have been doing our hand holding <coughs> after we joined here in the new ministry. Sumadan, Sabrina, Andadaji, Anant Rawaji, and our host, Mr. Vinit Rai. My <coughs> very valued colleague, Jyotsna, and friends. I'll not do any plenary address. I'll just uh, try to address some of the issues which have been uh, raised whether it is reaction, I mean, I don't know whether it will be construed as plenary address. One of the most important issues which has been raised is certification. <coughs> Certifications are after we kind of, after I also took over here on 2nd September, one has been grappling with several issues of the very complicated skills ecosystem and entrepreneurship ecosystem. But certification is definitely one of the most important issues which is facing the entire, the, whether it is the employers, whether it is the ministry, whether it is NSDC, whether it is the credit agencies, everybody. So I'd just like to inform you that, number one, on 17th March, a notification was issued, which is on the websites everywhere, clarifying that SSCs can issue non-statutory certification. <coughs> I have requested uh, the leap to make it, get it disseminated more widely. But there is non-statutory certification. What about statutory certification? 
you already have for example somebody works in lnt is trained there for 6 months and given a certificate that has a certain peer group acceptance somebody has worked in mahindra tech and after 6 months has got a certificate that again has a peer group acceptance so on so forth there are hundreds and hundreds of examples all over the country but the catch lies in the statutory certification which is which has a pan india acceptance and even is accepted in the skilling ecosystem abroad so i'm sure all of you are aware that uh, there was a notification issued on 27 december 2013 this is called notification of national skill qualification framework this is an 18 page notification uh the last page talks of implementation schedule and whoever wrote it at that time did a good job very good job in fact and by the way this has the mandate of the union cabinet it was passed by the union cabinet and it says if you don't mind it'll take me 2 minutes just to read one or two important sentences immediately after the notification of nsqf all other frameworks including the national vocational educational framework qualification framework released by ministry of hrd would cease to exist and would be superseded by the nsqf nsqf compliant training stroke educational programs stroke courses would be entitled to receive government funding on a preferential basis after the third anniversary date of the notification of the nsqf that is 27 december 16 government funding would not be available for any training stroke educational program stroke course which is not nsqf compliant all government funded training and educational institutions shall define eligibility criteria for admission to various courses in terms of nsqf levels the recruitment rules of the government of india and public sector enterprises of the central government this is the point you made and the minister made yesterday shall be amended not may be amended shall be amended to define eligibility criteria for all positions in terms of nsqf levels and similarly there are goal posts for fifth anniversary why i read it in front of all of you was just to buttress the point that this issue has been addressed at that level and is being taken up now how do we really make it compliant under the nsqf framework there is a body called nsqc which has to align or formally approve the occupational standards the qps and the nos created by nsdc hats off to the ssc's and uh, kind of uh, work done by dilip and his colleagues uh, in such a short time as on 31st first march 2015 they have together created the 28 extremely the 28 functioning sector skill councils which is they have created 6625 national occupation standards and 1319 qualification packs we have requested i also had a detailed talk with mr ramadurai the chairman of the nsda uh, and nsqa framework that in the next uh, maybe about maximum 2 to 3 months we should have a series of meetings in which all that has been done there is no need to kind of start doing uh, redefining the wheel and reinventing the wheel we could kind of take all this on board and and i am very very hopeful and in about 3 months time from now we should be seeing a picture with the national uh, at least most of the almost all the national occupation standards 
and maybe almost 80% of the QPs are formally cleared by the NSQC so that we could move to a regime where we could issue, start issuing statutory certifications, which should have a pan-India acceptance. This is so far as certification is concerned. On the skilling landscape, whatever little I have seen in the last five months, but, uh, I find there are, frankly speaking, uh, far too many islands of excellence which give us a lot of hope. And this is not trying to be optimistic for the sake of it, or just because one has to say certain things. I'll also say what are the areas of concern which should concern all of us. But these islands of excellence are in the skilling as well as in the entrepreneurship uh, landscape throughout the country. They are bearing those states which hardly have any economic opportunities where there are real problems which come up, which are also kind of reflected in one of the recent World Bank surveys. Other states, a uh, lot of people have done a lot of good work. This gentleman sitting here, Mr. Sabri Nath, by the way, how did we all meet? At least I requested JP Rai or NSDC DG uh, that we should have a monthly meeting of where we could see the innovations Suppose the innovation should be, uh, people could send them on the NSDA website. Their internal teams could then put up five, six, seven for presentation. And it was on that particular day that we we found uh, him. We found certain very good work done by LaborNet. Some very good work being done by one Mr. Vishwas Kulkarni in Pune in terms of aligning the requirements of industry and the requirements of employment. And his own project incubated essentially from IIT, Bombay, and other places, sorry, Chennai, and other places. And when I sent him to Chief Minister of Rajasthan, whose staff officer I have been for some time, the present Chief Minister, she rang me back to say that anybody like that, any other thing like that you find, Please talk to me, send him or her across, and we would see what we can do to align them in our system. So it's not that the, at a certain political level, uh, there's no recognition of this kind of efforts. Uh, having talked about islands of excellence, having talked about, having seen many investment bankers leaving uh, their uh, very highly paying jobs to work in Bhubaneswar and in Northeast. Having seen many very, very committed people working in uh, all these spheres, there's no name, point taking names because it's endless. Uh, the need of the hour, as has been realized by everybody over the last couple of years, is now to scale these up and scale them up very, very massively and scale them up even while ensuring speed as well as quality outcomes. Now that's a very, very, very easier said than done. You scale up with speed and you also keep on ensuring quality outcomes. For that, if I say that uh, some kind of a instant coffee solution has already been found, the answer is no. All various people are trying to find solutions in their own ways. Some of them are succeeding. We also in the government uh, when we are rewriting our uh, new skill policy, the good news is that now it will be called New Skill Development and Entrepreneurship Policy 2015. The original policy was 2009. Uh, we are also trying to find some kind of uh, uh, pan-India answers to these issues of scaling up with speed while ensuring quality outcomes. And I am glad to report to you, I would like, uh, right, like to report to you that we are putting up a full chapter on entrepreneurship space because the ministry in any case has been now being called skill development and entrepreneurship ministry. Another issue which is troubling us while we're talking of uh, uh, is the ITIs. And the ITIs, this was not essentially mentioned here, somebody mentioned some indirectly, uh, 
what needs to be done is how to align the ITAs with the industry. As a matter of fact, unless the skilling space, the industry, that is the employers, the academicia, that is various universities, including multi-skilling institutes, schools, large training partners like Centum, ILF, ILFS, etc., and those who are going to provide credit, credit, they all kind of converge together and become hubs and spokes of each other. We're not going to be able to achieve our goals. And there, I would, I want to report to you that we are discussing. Uh, we are very clear in our mind that we would not like to. We would like to adopt, for example, the best practices of Madhya Pradesh. If those could be taken to Odisha or from Odisha to, let's say, in Tamil Nadu, vice versa. And similarly, the best practices abroad. If we could align them to our milieu and adopt them here. For that purpose, we are having a very serious dialogue with two, three governments, including German government and Chinese government, to create multi-skilling institutes and to see how much the dual technology, how much the dual learning uh, of the present German system could be kind of uh, adopted uh, to our conditions. The recent amendments of the Apprenticeship Act uh, have probably made it easier for employers to be, I mean, they're, they're now far less skeptic. Maybe some more amendments are required. Maybe we're also taking up with the Ministry of Labor uh, that the apprehensions of the industry in this regard need to be allayed. Uh, before uh, I request you to ask us as many questions as you like, uh, on the entrepreneurship space, I mean, uh, when I was the chairman of the Rajasthan Industrial Development Corporation for almost eight years, and also secretary industries for about three and a half years, I found that some of the first generation entrepreneurs in the NCR area, for example, I mean, the kind of sheer industriousness and dedication they had, and uh, the way they have expanded, I mean, uh, and my own feeling is that system has to do only the slightest of hand holding, just the slightest of hand holding, no tweaking, no interference, no kind of inspector arch, only the slightest of hand holding at the right point of time in terms of uh, making available land required. In the case of IT industries, even that's not an issue. In manufacturing industry, it is an issue depending on the size of the manufacturing industry. Uh, the clearances, initial clearances, especially the environmental clearances, etc. And then, wherever required, even the state corporations are able to provide credit up to certain limits. And I find that a whole lot of people end up paying sooner uh, than their deadlines. So, I mean, there are people who are, there are people in the system who are black sheep. There, are, there could be people in the entrepreneurship space who are either confused or just kind of having short-term goals, that is different. But still, I, I must be knowing uh, maybe almost 100 people in the NCR area alone uh, who have done kind of uh, wonders in the last eight, 10 years. And if their case studies are made, uh, and I'm sure there would be similar people in Indore, there would be a lot of such people in Maharashtra. Uh, the other day, uh, the MD of the Wellspun came to see me and they were telling me that the present Prime Minister, when he was CM of uh, Gujarat, he told them to relocate to Bhuj after the earthquake for their expansion. Relocate to Bhuj after the earthquake. Today, by the way, they have 22,000 people working in Bhuj. 22,000 people working in Bhuj besides being the largest towel exporters of the country, they're also into the space of making pipes and those things. And now they want to go a step further, which is to want to open a huge multi-skilling institute. Uh, we are going there next week, 10 days, when the leap comes back, we'll together be going there and all working out together to see how we could kind of do that. So if somebody could 
with the and he also said that when they asked the present pm who was at that time cm gujarat what about water what about electricity in all those things in a record time uh, water was provided in that entire area by a 300 kilometer small i mean not small a canal from narmada and the entire area is a thriving township industrial township today so something similar happened long back not on that scale maybe but on a very impressive scale in latur so there are people who lap up a kind of i mean every opportunity can be taken as a every every calamity is a, even if the calamities can be taken as a challenge and an opportunity so i'm sure the normal milieus uh, can be taken as opportunities all the time so with this i'll uh, wind up ask the leap to take over again thanks a lot Uh, thank you um, mr rob uh, for your extremely you know i think what you've heard today is something which is not very well known about the certification the 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 uh, nsqf uh, the qps and nosses as well as the islands of excellence and the the whole thing of attempting to scale and the new policy and direction been given uh, by the ministry it's it's very 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 significant and you know the from the nscc standpoint also we you know earlier we were inundated with uh, uh, requests and meeting requests now it's actually become 10x because the ministry has really positioned it uh, very diff- differently under the able leadership of the secretary so it's open for questions uh, just to be brief uh, just mention who the question is to we'll just take three questions together and then we'll see yeah, yeah please Can you try lung power? Okay. Uh, have a dream to fill up all this gap. And for this thing, we know that one platform is the NSDC. When we collaborate with NSDC, we have skill training, we have certifications, we have standardizations. but after that we have to connect it with the employment opportunities so what is like the a part we connecting with the nsdc and the another part is like providing them employment opportunities so both of these things if we can club it together and we can have something and from people like us can collaborate with nsdc and with ma'am who can give us a scale up so we can have a lot of social entrepreneurs there Yeah, we we just going to take two three questions yeah yeah please you have a question okay uh, dilip um, amit bhatia from impact investors council my question is actually to you you are probably the not probably you are the biggest impact investment fund in case of skills and i think from my investment standpoint can you just share now now that this journey is 5 7 years old what has been the scale of investment how many enterprises is uh, are there any returns out there from your vantage point and what could this look like next 2 3 years so has this returned money to you thanks amit yes ma'am uh, hi so probably this question may be a little naive but i wanted to ask you like uh, do you think how soon do you think should vocational training be introduced to uh, the individuals don't you think that in school and college level also it needs to be introduced because i think the um, psychologically what we associate vocational training to is something like someone from the rural background or someone who's not from uh, uh, upper middle class family uh, only those people get associated with it and it's like the electricians the carpenters uh, the ones which require these kind of um, skills only they like that's the perception that's the normal perception that we have so don't you think that schools colleges also should introduce this particular program at a early age and condition the minds uh, so that going forward we have a brighter future yeah if you have your name then we can personally respond to you uh, my name is anandita thank you thank you thank you hi uh, my name is raj gilda from lender hand uh, india actually we are working with the schools to provide you know vocational training uh, two questions one is uh, who will police the police as we go 
you know, scaling up the training providers and other things. Uh, my concern would be about the assessors, you know, because the certification will not have any value uh, otherwise. So how do we, you know, uh, control that? And secondly, entrepreneurship. I'm so glad that the ministry also has the name entrepreneurship, you know, in that. And Mr. Uh, and, and sort of a rejoining that question what Anandika just uh, mentioned, there cannot be a job role for entrepreneur, right? There cannot be an NOS for entrepreneur. It has to come from within or it has to be developed. So can we have initiatives which sort of introduces entrepreneurship at the school level itself or, you know, uh, so that it gets going further, right? I, 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 did you introduce yourself? Hi, Raj Gilda from Lender Hand mm -hmm. India. I mean, I, I know you, but... Hello. Hello. Hi, this is Abhijit from Make in India. Uh, before I ask my question, I have to, uh, I'll have to tell you what we are doing actually. Uh, in Make in India, we are uh, indexing two kind of skills and the production which we are doing inside the country and kind of services and product which are available outside the country. These two indexes would match in future and then we'll be able to make sustainable uh, branch models of production. In these models, what we are getting from the outside, from the global market is kind of things which are available being smuggled or being uh, sold in a global market are almost on a level of extinct in India. Any art or any something like uh, in wellness, panch karma or uh, in a art, uh, rural craft areas. So this uh, is only about uh, taking uh, what uh, we are talking about skill building is only about doing the uh, scaled up or is there any art which exists in India which used to exist and now on extension are we going to do anything about them? Okay, we'll just stop here and can can I uh, request uh, would uh, any any would like to answer before I answer the two questions addressed to me and then request Mr. Arora to address? Shall I do that? Yeah, okay. So I think, uh, first of all, Aditya and, and Amit, uh, thank you for both of your questions uh, there. Um, just want to state that the sector skill councils have now said that if there is a certified person who holds a certificate issued statutory or non-statutory at this point, hopefully it all becomes statutory, they are willing to give a job offer in 21 days. Okay. But in our impact assessment studies that we have done, we found that we need to actually work more with industry and therefore, you know, Anand wearing a CI hat and the others of you wearing the other small and micro uh, uh, MSME association hats will be very uh, useful. So that model is actually coming in now. And the model has changed. You first get the job and then train people. I think Amit, uh, very interestingly, uh, 203 uh, partners approved as of 31st of March uh, close to 150 operational. 12 of our partners have got refinance and second, some of them got second and third round finance from venture capital organizations. See, what difference that it has made is now people are preparing balance sheets. The balance sheets are getting audited under the NSDC system and that's all being made available and you actually see it. 94% uh, repayment, including principal, last year. I mean, secretary doesn't know this number because the number just came in 94%, right? No, as of now, in the first four years, no de default. Yeah, we have three guys who are not doing well, but they have got a repayment plan uh, coming in, uh, going um, uh, forward. Total commitment, uh, 2,400 crores. Uh, total disbursement, about 800 crores. The income earned by these companies in operation now is exceeded, dis, uh, uh, excluding interest earned, is exclu uh, exceeded disbursement. So it's actually getting a scalable model. And the, the challenge is that every month when we make a presentation, the numbers go up and, you know, uh, it's a kind of a disbelief. So I think these two are, are actually, I think the other questions are very, uh, I mean, the secretary would be much uh, more powerful in addressing them. So Mr. Rora, the the vocational uh, training, if you would like to say, and then the, the anything. The question about vocational training is very relevant. Some states have started it on a pilot basis, like Haryana, NSDC, and their partners, they have succeeded in persuading the government to do it in, say, about 400 schools. But in Haryana itself, there are 23,000 schools. 
So that's why I deliberately use the word pilot basis. There are two parts of the question. One is vocational training, whether it is important. It's not important, it is essential. Since when idly from 8th onwards, 9th, sorry, 9th onwards, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, right? A whole lot of countries which have highly skilled manpower, you know the examples, Korea, China, Germany, USA, etc., Switzerland, they all have vocational training, one form or the other. And we have had it for the last 30, 35 years. We only kind of kept on producing, with all due regards, degree holding illiterates. <coughs> And that also in very large numbers who have a degree from some official college or the other, but who know nothing except having a degree. But the issue is that although it's directly being dealt with by MHRD, Ministry of Human Resource Development, we've been talking with them. One of the bigger is big issues which faces is the when you don't have normal, I mean, you have such a huge shortage of normal teachers, where are the teachers who will be uh, imparting pedagogy on the vocational side? It's not that this is a, a way of postponing the issue. There are resolutions of every issue. And the way out only is to create more and more multi uh, maybe skilling institutes, skilling universities in the country, at least a couple of mega skilling universities. And also, at a certain much higher level, the view has to be taken whether in the education side, would you not like uh, to do consolidation for some time instead of kind of mindless expansion that every state, every budget, thousand more schools and then no building and then kind of uh, try to find out first the buildings and the teachers, it takes five, six years. There would be a conference of the state ministers being spearheaded by our ministry sometimes in May. Some of the issues which we are going to raise, one of the major issues is vocational uh, training. We'll also be requesting MHRD to participate. To say that I can give you a roadmap just now, that will be factually incorrect. But yes, uh, there is kind of going to be a roadmap, you see, uh, and not in very distant future. Right? Another thing which I had forgotten to mention as an important issue, which I think I would like to mention before I close, is that uh, I think the, the employers also have to think as to what are the compensation patterns or incentives for reskilling and upskilling. Uh, that is something which the federation, whether it is CII, FICI, other federations, small industry federations, because CII at the end of the day has only 7,600 uh, members. Same would be for FICI. A lot of people in the small and medium industries. So one systemic change we are trying to introduce is that in all the sector skill councils, uh, we would have a mandatory presence on the sector skill councils at the governing council level of somebody from the small and medium industries so that their concerns are adequately reflected and they are also sensitized as to the issues in the landscape. But compensations and a career path is something which the employers have to look into. When Henry Ford started giving $2 a day way back in the early 20th century, most of the industry, his peers in the industry, and there were some of the most trenchant articles in the newspapers those days, calling him from a madman to whatever, all kinds of things. But it just revolutionized Detroit and it changed the face of automobile industry in the world. Somebody mentioned about assessors. Again, a very, very because when I had uh, I gone to a couple of, uh, talked to a couple of other colleagues and training institutes, I think assessors is an issue 
and sometimes they take inordinately long time and they the real danger is that they should not become some kind of a parallel inspector raj or a new inspector raj of skilling uh, this is a concern which is in my mind also and uh, i think shortly i will be sitting with uh, the ceo dilip to kind of try to see what can be done on that but the question is very valid a very valid concern thank you so uh, thank you is exactly 145 and i promise the team that we would end the uh, session uh, want to actually say four questions four answers technology is a must and has to be leveraged otherwise we can't scale are we skilling appropriately it's work in progress uh, new model and dramatic shift to ensure that we're going to uh, uh, be able to scale at speed at standards are we matching supply and demand the framework and like we said you know yesterday the minister said we have now the ambition because you know sectorally demand supply gap spatially uh, and i think the model is evolving uh, we again uh, need to scale are leveraging existing uh, capital appropriately uh, no and yes no because more people in this room need to be able to fund skilling initiatives and technology initiatives in the, in in the uh, skilling space yes because the ministry is leading the charge like you heard about the schools and the meeting held day before yesterday where all the power plants and the coal mines etc were offered their schools their training institutions their plants to do that so government infrastructure and private infrastructure is being uh, used uh, uh, to scale so i want to thank uh, first uh, mr sunil arora for actually spending time with us he's been throughout the panel discussion and uh, we have actually made it a very interesting uh, session thank you sir for being with us and for so lucidly actually sharing your views and communicating the initiatives of the ministry so to um, uh, anuradha uh, anand uh, sabri and madan uh, thank you very much for your time for your insights and uh, we expect you to actually this is the ecosystem uh, because madan actually was the assessor you know he was assessor in his earlier life and uh, he is being actually looked at and now on the other side uh, enabling that to happen thank you all of you for the audience for seeing uh, being such a great uh, audience and thank you sankalp and vinith and aprajit and the entire team for providing us this uh, platform uh -huh.